Sal Berry. Because breakers want to break, breakers want to grade, breakers want to flip. And Tim Parrish. I think they'd be fools to ignore the truckloads of money that fanatics would back up to the door. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Berry and with me is Tim Parrish. And today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of hockey card and hobby related stuff. This is just going to be kind of like a hodgepodge, a a mishmash, a bricolage of different topics that just come together to form this episode. So Tim, how you been? I've been all right. Sometimes I cry to myself, but no one listens or sees it. (laughs) So I am going to be doing another card show. I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. It's another one of those card shows at the Rosemont Skyline Room, Ludex Card Show at the Skyline Room. That's at 6920 North Mannheim Road in Rosemont. Admission is free. It's Saturday, September 24th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. There are three autograph guests, one baseball guy, one football guy, and one hockey guy. A hockey guy? The free autograph guest is Ozzie Guillen, who played for the Chicago White Sox a long time, and then he was the manager of the team when they won the World Series in 2005. So Ozzie Guillen is signing autographs for free at the show. 1985 Chicago Bear Matt Suey, who was part of the Super Bowl XX championship team, he's signing autographs. There is a cost for his autograph. It's $20. But... Then what they do is they give you a $20 coupon that you could basically spend at any dealer's table. You spend $20, but then you get like a $20 voucher that you can use at any dealer at the show. The third person who's signing autographs is Dale Talon, who played for the Blackhawks and also the Penguins, I might add. He was also a color commentator for the Blackhawks for a long time, and then he was also the team GM. Then he went over and he was the GM for the Florida Panthers for a while. So his autographs are $20 for a trading card or $25 for anything else. So, yeah, three different autograph guests, a a former White Sox player, a former Bears player, and a former Blackhawks player. And then, of course, I'll be there selling mostly hockey, but I'll have other stuff, too. So if you come to the show on Saturday, September 24th, please stop by and say hi. I'll have a link to it in the comments. What's Dale Talon doing now? Last I heard, he was like a scout for the Canucks or something. I think the last I heard, like him and John Shannon, like signed on to be scouts or something like that for the Canucks. I don't know if that's still going on or not, because that wasn't that long ago. It was a few months back. Yeah, Talon's an interesting dude. I'd love to see him on like NHL Network or something, you know, just one of the, the, the talking heads on that, you know, every now and then. I mean, he's he's done a lot. I mean, he's he was a player. He was a GM. And then, of course, he was um, a broadcaster, player, broadcaster, GM, and other stuff. So he's done everything. Yeah, definitely has an eclectic uh, mix of of jobs that he could speak about. Yeah. Well, this will be the first time he'll be doing an autograph signing in Chicago since he was fired way back in, like, 2009, no, 2010, right before the team won the championship. He was uh, demoted, and then he ended up leaving the team to take a job with the Panthers. So this is kind of like, you know, his first time back at uh, a convention in Chicago, because he used to be a regular at the Blackhawk conventions, and he used to be a regular at a lot of the things in the 90s that I would go to. I remember getting I remember getting some Canucks hockey cards signed by him in the early 90s, and he was sitting at a table, and I remember him looking at them and going, oh, my God, look at that, look at this guy or something, as he's looking at his picture from 20 years before. And I remembered he would take his card, and he would turn it sideways so that he could do a nice big autograph lengthwise. So it was like running up the side of the card, but it looked really nice, really nice autograph. Perfect. So let's talk about the National. They announced this a little while ago, but we wanted to talk about this. So the National Sports Collectors Convention announced that they're going to be in Chicago in 2023 and in 2025, and they're going to be in Cleveland for 2024. I don't know if Atlantic City was necessarily poorly received. I just think it's that they do every other year in Chicago, and then it seems like the other year, It's either going to be in Atlantic City, Baltimore, 
or Cleveland. I mean, there's a few other places it's been in. It's been that way in the quote unquote modern era. It has been in other places. Like it went down south before, it went west Mm -hmm. before, Mm -hmm. but we're talking honestly based off of the population of collectors that are out there now. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been in one of those places since most of these people have been collecting. Let's put it that way. There's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of reasons. Well, let's hear it. Uh, Well, they try to put it in a location that is going to generate a large population base. And they don't like to have the bulk of their presenters slash dealers slash vendors having to travel the farthest. And that's part of, I think that's part of the big reason why it never gets past the Midwest anymore. Because almost everything is from Midwest to East Coast. Does that mean that there's nothing out West and nothing down South? No, absolutely not. It just means that the vast majority of what they're trying to cater to, I think, has a little more accessibility that way. But the other part is venue, really. I mean, you got to have a venue that's capable of handling it. And sure, I'm sure there's plenty of places in Dallas and Texas. I'm sure there's plenty of places in California that you could go to or, you know, another state. You know, people have cried for years that it needs to come to Vegas where it's a resort town and there's plenty of places to stay, plenty of things to do outside of the actual convention itself. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad idea. But again, they're trying to minimize the travel for all of the people that are heavily monetarily invested and i think that's the reason why we see it east coast midwest east coast midwest back and forth that's a good point i mean if you look to in two years now it's going to be in cleveland which is not really east coast that's still midwest we're just going midwest chicago midwest cleveland midwest back to chicago and that's the thing it never gets further west of chicago you know could it go to st louis i can see them entertaining that nashville Absolutely. Even Texas. But going further west than that, I don't know. But there might be a one-off in the next 10 years. It's hard to say. I think the thing is, and I've said this before, okay, so talk about where all the big boys are located, right? You got Tops in New York. You got Panini in Texas. You got Upper Deck in California. I don't know where Fanatics is. Kind of all over the place because they buy everybody up. Yeah, I think their headquarters... I don't know if it still is. It used to be in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, that sounds Um, right. But I think they have operations in New York. And I mean, like you said, there's stuff worldwide because of how big the company is and how many different offshoots and subsidiaries that they have within. But I think the card function right now is probably either Jacksonville or New York. I couldn't tell you for sure. It's easy for all of these places to converge in Chicago. I know it's not geographically centralized, but travel-wise, it's central. I mean, I guess any of the big cities, you could get multiple flights. Big city to big city, it's pretty easy. And I think that, like, people in California are like, well, okay, if I can't have the show in California, then Chicago's at least doable via flight. People in New York are like, well, if I can't have it in New York, at least Chicago's a couple hours away by flight right? So it's doable. And for dealers, like when myself and my friend traveled to Atlantic City, we drove, it was a 14 hour drive. Oh, dude, that reminds me, I should have brought this up when you, me and Clemente were talking about the the national. When we drove through Pennsylvania, dude, they have these awesome, I don't know what you call them, convenience stores called Sheets. Did they have those when you lived there? Of course they did. Dude, Sheets is like a 7-Eleven, but They make food hot and fresh. This this is hilarious. No, because it was like 11 o'clock and I was hungry and I didn't want McDonald's. And I walk in there and I'm just expecting like they're going to have like a grab and go hot dog or something or a grab and go slice of pizza. So I'm like walking around and I'm like. MTO made to order. And I'm like, where's the food? And I'm like walking around and I'm like, where's the food? And they're like, oh, you order it. I'm like, oh, what do I do? You go to that touch screen and you go through it and you pick what you want. I'm like, oh my God, where was this when I was 16? Of course I wasn't in Pennsylvania, but I mean, oh my God. And they're just like, yeah, you want a hamburger? We'll just make it for you right now. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, like midnight. And I'm like, this is so awesome. (laughs) All right. Well, since you brought it up. I had to. Sheets is half of the state. 
the other half of the state, they have something called Wawa. And so I don't know, as you got to the eastern side of the state and closer to New Jersey, they have Wawa's. And, and there too. It's, They're not as yeah, good. You said it. <laughs> well, Wawa's just people from Pittsburgh fun. will argue that Sheets is better than Wawa. And people from the other side of the state, Philly area, they will argue that Wawa is better than Sheets. And these are conversations that I get into fairly often with Pittsburgh people versus Philadelphia people. How is and, a place that makes the food to order at like any hour of the night how is that not better i, I don't disagree with you honestly because you know what the only thing that that's what i grew up with the only thing wawa had going for it was they had all cans of starbucks energy drinks two for four bucks that's the only thing they had going for it so they're like all right two for four i'll grab another two but yeah sheets man that's the sheet so anyways driving through pennsylvania and and getting to the national in atlantic city that was doable. Like a 14 hour trip is doable. I said to my friend, I'm like, what happens if they have the show in Los Angeles in like three years? Oh, we're just not going to go. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that'd be like a miserable drive. Yeah. And a lot of people aren't going to drive West Coast. That's that's exactly it. I guess that's the thing, though, is that it does shut out a lot of like West Coast dealers. It does. Who would want to set up and sell. I mean, it doesn't become a one-day thing. It becomes a couple-day trip. But, uh, yeah, so I'm glad that it's going to be in Chicago because I'm in Chicago, so it's a home game for me. Going on a road trip was fun, and playing in a road game was fun, and it was a great experience. And, you know, when the National is in Cleveland in 2024, I'll be all about going to that. I'll I'll be excited about that. I'm glad that they are going to kind of just do the status quo, you know, where they keep doing Chicago every other year. Yeah, we're biased because we're local. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just like if I lived in Toronto, I'd be like, the expo it is. The expo it is. You know what? I'm going this year. I'm not I'm not selling. I'm just going to walk around and buy stuff. Good for you. For years, I've been saying I'm going to go to the Toronto Expo, and now I can finally make it happen. So we'll talk more about that show as we get closer to it. Um, Did you experience any of the quote-unquote negativity that Atlantic City had to offer while you were there? Or did you just pretty much, you were at the show, out of the show, back to the hotel, you didn't really deal with a lot of stuff? Well, the negativity that was at that show, I thought we talked about it with uh, Clementi, was um, the lack of Wi-Fi at the convention center, okay. the lack of parking at the convention center, the outrageous prices for the food. I think the biggest complaint I heard was just quality of life around the area. I mean, I, I only know my experience of being in Atlantic City because I've been there multiple times, not for the national. I mean, just like any area, there's there's sketchy places. And that's why people, people are like, well, it's in Chicago. I mean, Chicago is the crime capital. People got to understand this. This is in Rosemont. So anything you see on the national news all the time of people getting shot and killed on a daily basis, that is not Rosemont. <laughs> Rosemont is nowhere near Chicago in the grand scheme no. of things. Well, it's just they just call it that because the airport's there. Chicago just stretches out just long enough to encompass the airport to get the tax dollars. Right. But on like either side of it, it's like not Chicago. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, nowhere, that's a nowhere stretch. near there. It's a completely different thing. I mean, the convention center, everything around it is hotels and restaurants and office buildings. And it's not even, no, it's, there's yeah. no comparison. Yeah. So. Anyway, not to so, beat a dead horse, but let's talk about trading card database and sports lots uh, combining their efforts for data. So, could this mean that we're finally going to get pictures on sport lots? Uh, uh, I I don't think so. What? No, if they're combining data. I think they're only really doing that for, from what I read, trading card database is just trying to look for pricing data, some type of source for pricing data, and. You know, having Sport Lot agree to provide that information so that they can show pricing trends on all of their checklists, I think would be beneficial for them. So I think that's why they're doing it. And in return, Sport Lots is getting access to all the non sport stuff so they can expand that out because they haven't really done much with non sport up to this point. So I think that's what their goal is, is to try to get get that available for more sellers on there so that there's a bigger exposure. You know, things like gaming cards and movie cards and all that kind of stuff. So 
I doubt you're going to see a format change to the site of Sport Lots to allow for better user experience. <laughs> I'm oh, trying to put that. I'm trying to put that lightly because I do like Sport Lots. But... Oh no, it has so many problems. You have to figure out how to use Sport Lots, and you know what? I've been you using do. it quite a bit lately because I've been buying up a lot of cheap cards to finish sets, and I like it, but it's work. Like you said, when we talked about ways to complete your sets, and I said this was the one that I didn't really use a lot, and you said, oh, it's good, it's just work. And you're right, this is not like, I'm going to hop on Sport Lots and buy a couple of cards and be done in 15 minutes. This is like an hour. This is where you find the guy that's selling the one card that you need for 18 cents has nothing else that you want. So then you decide to buy the card from somebody else for 22 cents because he has 30 other cards that you want. And you figure, well, if I'm going to pay $4 shipping, I might as well get 40 cards for that. Well, if you get one card, shipping is usually like a buck and a quarter. I mean, I remember buying four cards from Canada, which came to like $1.50. And I think the shipping was $1.50. And then I think with tax and everything, all was said and done, I got four cards for about four bucks. But they were four cards that I wanted and I was happy to pay a buck a piece for. But you don't want to spend 18 cents on one card and then $1.25 for shipping. You go, well, I need four cards, but then you see that's $2 or $3 shipping. And you go, eh, okay, what else do they have? And then there and becomes the time investment. What would save me time is if they had little thumbnail images because sometimes I forget, especially if I'm outside of hockey, like, wait, what does the 87 Tops football design look like? Is that this one or is that that one? And so I wish it just had the little thumbnail picture. So you go, oh, yeah, okay, I know what card that is. Like a stock photo. Even if it said stock photo, not the actual photo, you know, not the actual item, that's cool. That's fine. Yeah, I can't see them moving up to that point. There are photos on there that you can find and click on, but they're not like easily accessible. They're user submitted for They're user submitted, right. Specific card. Right. It's not like Com C where you go on and everything's scanned. Yeah. For every card. And if you click on a specific card, that's that card. So if there's a ding in the corner of one and not on another, you could see the difference and decide which one you want to buy. You don't really see that on sport lots because of the volume. It's kind of an antiquated type system but and it does require work but yeah I, I don't see that change i mean if there's people out there listening that are sport lot people hit us up if you know more tell us more right, but right. i i couldn't foresee that i mean that would be a huge huge undertaking for them to change the entire platform to make it like that i think this is more a benefit you know yeah it's getting them what they want on the on the one side but i think this helps trading card database kind of make a more robust upgrade to pricing data that they already have available, which is mostly user submitted. So. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people really submit prices on Trading Card Database. I, mean, I don't think so either. I think it might be a very small percentage. I mean, I do sometimes, but that's mostly for like my own PC on there. Like if if I've got, you know, Bill Guerin cards that I might be logging on there. And I know I bought two of them on eBay for whatever, or, you know, I picked one up at a card show for whatever. I'll put it in there and I'll submit it. And that way I have it. And so I can go back and look and be like, oh, yeah, I paid three bucks for that. Or, you know, oh, yeah, I, that's the one I paid $54 with shipping. So at least I know. But that's for my own reference. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not the guy that's trying to look for, oh, what's my collection worth? I don't really care. But I just do that so I can look back and remember, oh, yeah, I paid $4 for this. And here's another one listed for like $78. So mm -hmm. I'm not buying that one. Right, right, yeah. Trading card database they use for a lot of things. I mean, mainly to research players, like what cards they have and stuff. I don't really think about that like when I'm looking for a price on something. Sometimes it's more just like, you know, what set is this insert from? Or yeah. how many cards does this guy have? You know, I want to get something autographed. Let's browse the image gallery and just see what cards he has. I probably utilize Trading Card Database at least once every day. And if I don't do it once every day, it's at least four times a week. Easily. And it's for all of the same reasons you are. I mean, in fact, on Sunday, we were watching the football games and, you know, Presley Harvin, the punter for the Steelers. I was like, I wonder, does he have any cards? So 
popped up trading card database just to see. Sure enough, he has 12 cards. They're all from contenders, and every one of them's autographed. He might have more. Those are the only ones that are logged on there. So, Well, the only thing that I will use Beckett for, the online price guide, and I don't have a subscription to that, so I can't see the prices. But what I like that for is like let's let me give you an example right like let's say i have a mario lemieux card and it's card number one but i have no idea what year it's from i could put in mario lemieux space one and it'll list every mario lemieux that is card number one so of course in my example it'll list 88 tops 88 opc 89 tops 89 opc because he was card number one in those four sets but then any other like insert set where he might be the first card or later sets where he was like the first card. So that helps a lot, especially if it's like, uh, okay, this is a Wayne Gretzky and the number on the back is GL25. And I have no idea what that is. And I can't make out the copyright date and it's a tops card. And I'll put those in that data and it'll usually like pull like the specific card. Whereas if I try that on trading card database, It'll just give me search result Wayne Gretzky, search result Mario Lemieux, but not like the specific card or insert set. I agree. I use a combination of the two sometimes. I'll also use ComC too, because you can search, you search in the main bar, like Mario Lemieux, Mm -hmm. and then over on the sidebar, you can search within the search and I'll put in like something else. Like if I only want to see the tops cards, I'll put that in and it'll show me just tops or whatever. There's plenty of ways to skin a cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The worst way is going through an actual printed price guide. That's the only thing I like about a printed price guide. And I had to do this when I bought some baseball cards off of somebody. Is that I was able to just take a stack of cards, like say 71 tops baseball, and just go through the price list and be like, common, 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 ooh, rookie card common oh wow this one's a $20 card you know what I mean even if it's not a $20 card at least I knew it was significantly worth more than a common so in that case then having that sort of like a a list like that is kind of good of course you could pull up a list like that but the online price guide subscription is so expensive and you know you got to resubscribe to it every year and I used to have that when I would put my collection online because I would manage my collection through there and then it just became way too tedious to keep up with it, so I just stopped. Well, I remember when OPG was like 30 bucks a year. And I was like, yeah, that's about the price of the book. Okay, cool. And then it like doubled. It went to like 70 and I'm like, what the hell? Is that what it is now? I don't know what it is now, but I'm talking about in like the 2009, 2010, 2011, right around there. The first or second time I wrote for Beckett, like, I did a couple of different stints as a writer for Beckett Hockey. And I think the first time I wrote for Beckett Hockey, they just gave me a, a, a subscription to the price guide. Because they're like, well, you're writing for us here. Have this subscription to this price guide because it'll help you in, with writing your articles. I'm like, oh, wow, that's really thoughtful. And then later on, they wouldn't give me that. But then I ended up subscribing to it. But then they upped the price and then I just stopped. Yeah, I was just like, well, I'm not going to pay, you know, 100 bucks a month or excuse me, a hundred bucks a year for an OPG subscription. Yeah, I was just looking while we were talking about it. I mean, you have to subscribe to all of them separate. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> From what I can see here. Yeah. You get you get web access and mobile access, but you have to choose all of the sports separate. I don't see a package where you have all of them. Maybe there is. Maybe I'm just missing it, but... I'm not going to throw the price out because we're not being sponsored by these guys and they're oh, not paying us anything. Price. I want to know what it is. <laughs> really? Yeah, I do. Uh, if I said it was 70 bucks about 10 years ago, I want to know what it is now. So if I click on hockey, uh, the web and mobile for 12 months is $129.99. So 10 bucks a month, 11 bucks a month. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah. So that's a savings of 34% off of oh. the original price of oh, no. 198. Where but they, they always that price. I don't know. They always have it on sale cuz like the regular like they have a 15 day it's like $13 but it's on sale for like 12 bucks. But that's the thing. If you click on any of the other ones like for instance, oh, let's say I want football instead. 
if it goes off the football, well, that's 129. Yep. So it's like, okay. So you're talking 130 bucks a pop. If I want the four major sports, good Lord. There's got to be some kind of combination thing. I'm just not seeing it, but that's, that's, neither, right. here, that's neither here nor there. Never, I didn't see, set out to talk about the Beckett online price card. No, 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 no. We wanted to talk about hockey cards. So let's, shall we talk about hockey cards? Mm-hmm. The big news on Twitter today was that the checklist for 22-23 Upper Deck Series 1 Young Guns was released, full of um, some pretty good rookie cards. Yay! We know that we're getting Upper Deck Series 1. We know it's coming out in November and not February, so that's good. Things are starting to get back to normal, at least with Upper Deck's most popular sets. And we have a pretty stacked rookie class because we have some guys that turned pro at the end of this season this past season so it's too late to put them in extended so they're going to be put in series one so that's exciting yeah and it's a, I i mean it's a list of pretty much all of the names that people have been crying about for the last two releases that haven't showed up yet on a checklist so a lot of them are here you got mm-hmm. players that have been in the league which seems like forever, like we were talking beforehand, you were like, hasn't Matt Boldy been in the league a while already? Yeah, he played like 50 games last year. So the Matt Boldy card kicks it off, which we already knew he was going to be in there because I think he was the preview image for the Young Guns on there. But you've got Matty Beneers in there. You've got Owen Power in there. So two of the top draft picks. Um, you got Marco Rossi, who a lot of people are going to sock that one away because mm-hmm. that, that could be a sneaky good one. Lucas Reichel is in that list. Jack Quinn is in there. Uh, Lucas Donstol is in there. I think the Penguins have Valtteri uh, Pustinen mm-hmm. is on the list. I think that's the only Penguin in Series 1. I think the Blackhawks have a couple. Well, you, you mentioned uh, Lucas Reichel. Yeah. I think they have uh, Alex. Alex Lassick is Lassick, in there, too. yeah. It's a good list of, of names that aren't necessarily ones that you're going to look at right off the bat and go, who? If you're a hockey fan, you've probably heard a lot of these players' names because many of them showed up in the second half of the season last year. And a lot of them looked fairly decent and have some promise. So I think people are going to be happy with this. But again, that's always a double-edged sword, right? People get high anticipation over what's going to be in that checklist, and they look at some of these names, and they're like, holy crap, it's so-and-so. Yeah, what's this going to do to box prices on release day? That's my only question. So Upper Deck Series 1, the box prices on those have normalized. That You could still get hobby boxes as of this recording. Series 1, Series 2 extended. We're looking at like around 90 to 100 bucks a box. Especially now... Like- now, but they've been out for a while. Yeah, but when Series 1 dropped, it was like 140 a box, which is why I was doing exclusively retail tins. Now I'm kind of like, well, do I want to do more tins of Series 2, or do I just want to get a hobby box? Because it's like the same price now. Pre-sales of Series 1 were about 140 bucks. When it hit shelves, it was 160 right out of the box, and so was Series 2. Series 2 dropped way quicker than Series 1 did last year. With this class, though, you know, having Owen Power in there and Matty Beneers specifically with those two guys, it's going to be Alexei Lafreniere frenzy, I think. I don't think I bought any hobby that year because of Lafreniere, but I bought a lot of retail. And the thing is, is that all the prices eventually went down and then it came out on EPAC. And EPAC was kind of like a more normal price, <laughs> normal quotes, right? You know, ah, yeah, sure, three ninety nine to pack, okay. What I'm saying is like, yeah, when it drops, the price is high. Because why? Because breakers want to break, breakers want to grade, breakers want to flip. So they're going to charge the breakers more. Or they're going to charge people who wanted that, that like, I need to have mine on eBay first. I mean, I remember the Lafreniere Young Gun being a $600 card. I remember people paying 600 bucks for it. I remember looking at the finished auctions and they were like 500 600 dollars for a guy who hadn't played a game yet by the way we did talk about this a couple years back we did a podcast called the zelexi lot living up to the hype we did address that so 
this sort of thing happens where like whoever puts the first one out there is going to make the most money on it. And by the time enough hands get the cards and put it up of it on eBay, then all of a sudden that depresses the selling price. And then all the other prices go down. Now you don't have people hell bent on buying a case of series one because they're like, Oh, well there's like tons of that card or those cards on eBay now. And then they lose interest. The price goes down. And then the, the normal people like you and me can go and buy a box for a decent price. Well, and breakers aside, I'm not even talking about the breakers. I was talking more of the resellers that are out there, the bigger, you know, the bigger online retailers and even the local card shops. I mean, those were the price points that were up there. And and you're right. If it's us buying it, I mean, obviously you want to, you'd love to go out there the first day and get grab a product when it drops and be like, yeah, I got you know fresh box, you know, brand new stuff, but you're going to pay for it. If you wait to buy series one, when series two comes out, it's going to be less. Yeah. You know, if you wait to buy series two when extended comes out, it's going to be less. If you don't buy any of them at all and wait till the following year, you might still see that it's less, but I think there's going to be a lot of hype over this initial young gun checklist. I think, since it was released with enough advance notice, I think it's going to create some more hype. And the fact that we're going into the start of the season here and you have a lot of these guys that are potentially going to be on the starting opening day rosters, it's going to have some push. It would not shock me in the least if you did not see box prices push over the 160 mark out the door right off the bat you could probably buy them for less now in pre-sell but once these hit and are available i could see this up there at least for a while all right what's that you want to talk about next you want to talk about opg as long as we're on the topic of 22 23 sure all right so opg is happening and it's going to happen in march march 15th of 23 so instead of it being an early release it's going to be a later release that makes me hope then it's going to have a stronger rookie class. You might hope, but considering the sell sheets finally went live for this and they've shown pretty much what all of the inserts and the base cards and everything are going to look like. I hate to say this, but I think the checklist is probably already made. Just going out on a limb. OPG and MVP pretty much have the same rookie card. Sort of. OPG's had more. OPG's had more guys, some deeper guys. If you look at what MVP that just came out, if you look at that rookie checklist, it's almost the same as these young guns nice. we just talked about. It's almost the exact same. So those that want these young guns now, which you can have them just on MVP cards, <laughs> want them or not, they're available. They're yeah, just I mean, young guns yet. So those are out there. But I imagine all the same guys will be available on OPG. There'll probably be a couple deeper guys that you might not see. Yeah, if I was a betting person, I'd say the checklist is probably, if not mostly done, it probably is almost is is already done. Is this going to push back? Do you know how Upper Deck Series Two has the OPG update cards? Yes. It's almost like OPG is coming out at the same time as Upper Deck Series Two. So mm-hmm. I'm wondering if those are going to be almost released at the same time. So you're going to be getting. OPG update cards at the same time as OPG cards, or are they going to put OPG update in extended? Assuming there's a 22, 23 extended. I imagine there will be. Yeah, Yeah, I imagine there will be. It's done well, and they have plenty more designs that they can throw out there for insert cards. So, well, you know, they need to make a card of whatever teams that Dane O'Chara or Joe Thornton end up on next year. So, have you seen him skating for the Sharks? Who? Joe Thornton. No. He's been skating for the Sharks pretty much through camp so far. I don't know if he's actually being signed to a contract with them, but I've seen some video of him out there on the ice shooting pucks and hanging with guys. And so who knows? We'll see. All right. So we'll need to have a card of Joe Thornton in a Sharks jersey for the 2023 releases so yeah so opg is out and uh yeah they're gonna have the the playing cards will be back patches variations all that good stuff i don't mind opg being an early release i don't mind it being a late release i don't really care i mean i remember 0607 it was i want to say it was a later release that year i think it came out towards the end of the year 
It was kind of a bit of a surprise when Upper Deck first started doing Opeachy cards. I mean, I like the set because it's got tons of cards. I like the fact that they update it. I just think that if it's coming out in March, the cards that come out in March should be updated. Because if you're releasing cards in March, you should be able to get photos from October, November. And maybe they will. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Because like I said, the, the fact that we were waiting for so long and there was talk about it and we talked on show before and I've had people reach out on social media asking about it. Like if we heard anything, cause having not heard a thing this late in the year was kind of troubling to the OPG fans being like, uh, please tell me they're not putting the kibosh on this, on this oh, set. Well, you know, and then we found out they weren't. We're still waiting for the cup on 2021. Yeah. Interesting. You bring that up. Cause I saw, kind of a sell sheet floating around out there on social media of the cup with some preview images mm -hmm. and it's 2021 cup and it's funny because we're talking about 22 products we already have 22 products on the market yet here's the cup still hasn't come out 2021 i don't know a release date i haven't seen a release date i don't know what the specs are i imagine it's going to be similar to what it's been in the past all i know is there's monumental patch cards and they're using the 0304 exquisite design for the limited logos. That's really all I saw. I seen a picture of the Lafreniere. Somebody was like pre-selling it on eBay or something. Cause somebody like took a screenshot of this and said, I don't understand this. Why is this card so much? And why does it say LeBron? And then somebody said, oh, well, because that's the most famous LeBron James rookie card used that 0304 exquisite design. That's also why. somebody's calling it the LeBron design. Nice. Yes. Of course. Right. Why wouldn't they? It's like when people talk about, I don't understand hockey cards. Who's this Connor McDavid? And people say, he's like LeBron and Michael Jordan. No, no, he's not. I, I just hate making comparisons between sports of people. And I get it. It puts the point across for simple people, but I don't like it. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Right, 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 right. Well, it's another one of the grinds my gears things. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're going to compare Jordan to Gretzky, that makes sense. But you can't say he's both Jordan and LeBron. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's any of them. We'll see the cup at some point. Is this going to be the set that breaks a thousand bucks a box for hockey? Um, I'm talking about when it drops, not not secondary market later on, like five years from now. Is this going to be a thousand dollars a box? Well, considering it's a 2021 product, so you have to look at the rookie class from that year. So that's the Lafreniere year, which is also going to have Kaprizov in it. Ottinger. Yeah, you're going to have a list of now established rookies that have a lot of hobby pull. Can you expect to see a six, seven hundred dollar box push a thousand? Yeah, I think we've seen that in all the other sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, it's not going to be on those same levels, but it'll be relative based off of the size of the hobby. And I think that's quite a possibility, yes. So speaking of expensive boxes, talk about the 2021 Skybox Metal Universe Champion set, because wasn't this an expensive box? Yeah. These are selling right out the door, like six, seven hundred bucks. And then they got up to over a thousand within a few days of them being for sale. The Skybox Metal Universe Champions is the multi-sport set. So this is what people have to remember. This isn't Metal Universe hockey. This is the champion set. So basically it's upper deck pulling from all of their sports licenses that they have with various athletes and whatnot to come up with a hodgepodge mixed sports set, kind of like what Goodwin Champions is. So you have this mix of everything. What I found interesting about this is there's only three hockey players on the entire list checklist. Wow. Three. And it's, Matt Savoy, Shane Wright, and Gretzky. That's it. No one else. So if you look at the entire breadth of, this, of the checklist, from base card all the way down to every insert, those are the only three. What do you know about Matt Savoy? Other than he was a highly touted draft pick, I don't know a lot about him. Yeah, because I know Shane Wright has an exclusive autograph deal with Upper Deck. Oh, Matt does too. After the rookie photo shoot, when rookie camp started across the NHL, 
Upper Deck posted a number of things showing him signing for their exclusive Upper Deck products through their UDA licenses. So like pucks and sticks and helmets and gloves and all that kind of stuff that they normally get signed by their players. But he's a pretty decent player. I don't know that much about him. No, 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 that's fine. I don't need his full resume. But okay, so he's a highly touted draft pick and he has an exclusive with Upper Deck. And then Shane Wright, fourth overall, also has an exclusive autograph deal. And then Gretzky's Gretzky. I guess the point I was going to get to was that free players, free hockey players. So Upper Deck is obviously not catering to hockey fans with this. They're like, oh man, all these people are going crazy for basketball and baseball and football, and all we make is hockey. So let's make a really expensive multi-sport set, downplay the hockey, and really make it appeal to collectors of the other sports. That's what I feel like they're doing with this. And that's kind of what it is. I mean, like I said, it's it's the audience here would be like the Goodwin Champion type audience that likes to see that eclectic mix of different stuff. You know, think Allen and Ginter in baseball, where you have a baseball base set and then all sorts of crazy stuff you know, throughout. That's kind of the, the same type of thing, but this is a multi-sport set. And you got to remember, the only license Upper Deck has is the hockey license. This is not an NHL product, and it's not an NHL endorsed product. All right, so you're not so, paying any league or league rights. So your only exclusive licenses that you have with hockey players are those three main guys right there. So that's kind of why you are only seeing those three, but I, I found that interesting that they wouldn't have maybe thrown in a Connor McDavid here or there, or, or their poster boy, Nick Suzuki, who just got named captain of the Canadians. Last I checked, he was a exclusive UDA player as well. So I don't know if Alexei's contract is up with them. It might be. Do you have any idea how many packs come in a box or like roughly how many cards you get? Is this like one of those like, one pack per box, six cards type of thing? Or is this more like a 20 packs per box kind of, or 18, I guess, packs per box? Here, I just I just pulled it up. This retailer yeah. has it for 1,200 box. Okay. And <laughs> so, it's, box? so it's even higher than it was two minutes ago when we started this conversation. Um, <laughs> there, there's seven seven cards per pack and 15 packs per box. So on average, what you're going to pull out of here, so there's going to be six inserts. They're either going to be the Arc Weld ones, Intimidation Nation, or the Blast Furnace cards, which the Blast Furnace cards are interesting looking because they're not what you would think. Like if you hear Blast Furnace in your head, they're not what you would think. They're mostly like black color, and they just they have a player superimposed over like a flame in the background. It's not even a real flame. It's like a, I don't know what the right word is, like a pixel like a gif of a flame of, of a flame yeah so it's, it's like just, pixelated yeah it's not pixelated but it's like an artwork for a flame wow. instead of like actual fire when you said blast furnace you know what immediately came to mind to me it's the steelers but that's just me thermal threats that's what i thought like oh they're not that obnoxious they're not okay. that obnoxious. okay um so you also get three premium cards um which are basically a subset with the same players from the base set, just a little different, different stock, different design. Um, 97, 98 retro cards, you get three of those, and you'll get at least one autograph, PMG, or other low numbered parallel or insert. Mm -hmm. And then you get one reaching for the stars or a cut above card. That's it. So seven cards per pack. That's what's going to be in a box. Yeah, there's more cards here than the typical hit box where there's five cards in a pack or seven cards in a pack or whatever, and only one pack. But the price point on that, that's something. That is something. For a product that most people are going to turn and look at and be like, wait a minute, this isn't even licensed. Are you kidding me? But the fact that they have cards in there of people like, you know, again, the the hockey guys, which aren't the big players, but you've got Jordan, you've got LeBron James, you've got Ken Griffey Jr., you've got Tiger Woods, you've got, you know, Trevor Lawrence in there, you've got Mac Jones in there, you've got, in golf, you got Bryson DeChambeau, 
what's that snowboarder girl from the Atlanta? Chloe Kim mm-hmm. is in there. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that, outside of the realm of just one individual sport. And really, where else are you going to get Jordan cards? New ones. Because obviously no one produces new Jordan cards without being sued. So 1200 bucks for a box? I'm going to just go out on a limb and say I will not be opening a box of this. Okay, so we have some announcements on 2122 Upper Deck Clear Cut and 2122 stature yeah clear cut was announced december 21st i think is what i saw on there Mm -hmm. obviously those are not written with pen something i found interesting there they have the clear cut winners if you remember those from way back in the day where they were kind of like the see-through sort of holographic it throws back to that that old design of those. That was kind of cool. I saw that on the sell sheet. They brought back the Champs again, too, which is always interesting to me that Champs is included in Clear Cut because they are neither clear nor cut. But yet yeah, somehow Champs they're is kind in there. Of the opposite. Champs is like, Champs needs to be low tech. We're talking about like Champs cigarette type cards. They look very similar. Uh, they were in this past year's. Uh, the new Clear Cut that came out was 2021. Um, they were in there. They look almost like the 2015-16 design of the Champs cards. Mm-hmm. I'd love for them to go back to like the 08, 09, or 09, 10 design, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, so I just think it's interesting that here's a product called Clear Cut. Most of the cards are clear. The big draw to this is everything's on card as far as autographs go, but those cards aren't clear. They're cool looking. They're just not clear. I feel like they should be stuck in a different product. No, I agree. I agree. What was the year of champs that had the colored borders? Was that nine ten? Well, the borders right. weren't color. the the in, The interior was color. That was nine ten. It was 9-10. like the blue, okay. the teal, the red, the yellow, and the yellow animal parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the eight nine better. I mean, now that I think about it, that was like hockey's Allen and Ginther cards. Yeah, I mean that's when eight nine came out. It almost looked exactly like an Allen and Ginther. Oh, and I love that set, and I wanted to return to that look. Yeah, I don't mind that set. I like the colored ones though myself. Oh, I, those I are know. nice too. Don't get me wrong. I have an affinity for those since I sought out to not necessarily build a master set per se, but a pretty darn good one. <laughs> Let's yeah, put it that I'm way. Trying to do the same thing with thirteen fourteen prism hockey. With the the red, green, blue, red pulsar, blue pulsar, and purple and orange parallels, and then I gave up. <laughs> but I tried. See, that's difficult with those because you had some of those that were special releases, like a lot of those cracked ice ones and stuff, were giveaway cards or only available yes. certain places, and you know the reds were Target only, the blues yep. were Walmart only. Yep. So, yeah, that's difficult to put together. At least with the champs ones. They were all out of the same place. They were just very, very short printed right. for some of the other ones. Yeah, so Champs is back in the clear cut. And then Stature was announced. I saw that. It's got a tentative release date of uh, January 11th. So that probably could very well be the first product to drop in the new calendar year. It's similar to what it's been. One pack in a box, eight cards in a pack. I think that's usual. Unless it was seven before, but I think it was eight. The design on these... If you find the sell sheet and look at it, mm-hmm. the design looks exactly like the other years. I, I feel like there's not a real distinguishing aspect between them that you could lay one of them next to each other and be like, okay, this is from 19, this is from 20, this will be from 21. They really look the same. It's a cool design. I like the design. I like stature. It's just, okay. It's almost like this is now series three of stature. <laughs> right. So I kind I don't of know. would like to see that sort of thing. I guess like a like a set that just kind of grows and they just add to it. But I guess it, it couldn't really be year specific. Isn't that kind of what they were doing with chronology? That's what I thought was the plan for chronology, but they did volume one and volume two, and that was the end of that. I mean, you remember what happened with volume two. That was that right was with the uh, right Spirit in the pandemic. Universe. Yeah, it was yeah. right in the pandemic. They couldn't get the product. They wanted to get it out, so they decided to scrap 
using the, you know, the manufactured fabric and they started using styrene, which was the same thing they used on the golf scorecards in their golf sets. So it raised the question of, okay, what is this? It's like a piece of paper stuck, stuck in here. So, yeah, I mean, I thought that was the intention there. I figured there'd be a chronology three and then so on and so forth. And they would just keep going with it. But I, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's been other ones in other sports that have done that. Wasn't there, there was one in baseball where there was like a couple thousand cards in a set. Was it like the Yankees legacy one? Yeah. They just was, kept releasing. I think they did one where they did one card for every Yankees game that was played at Yankee stadium. Yeah. It was something like that. Or Tops think, was like a living set of like Star Wars where they'll add three cards a week or something or every two weeks or whatever. And it's just like the same set that just grows. So it's not like, okay, this is the 2021 set. I'm just saying like, it'd be cool to just have like a, you know, like there's a set of cards. Okay, now we're going to add to the set of cards, but it looks the same. And then just have the set grow over 10 years. And then just like, I know we like stats on the back. This would kind of negate that a little bit. But uh, just a thought. You'd run into the issue like with Tops Living. The whole idea was never to print two cards of the player in the same uniform, I think was the deal. Once you print them, okay, well, we got the starting lineup of pretty much every team. What do we do now? All right, well, we'll make a card of this guy who sat on the Black Aces for one day. Okay, we, we got this fourth string goalie that never made it out of the OHL. <laughs> what do you what do you do once you run out of players? Yeah, well, hey, if they're gonna do black aces, and I'll finally get a Carter Hutton as a Chicago Blackhawks card for my Carter go. Hutton collection, and he's that or you retired, make the... so he's not gonna be, have any cards coming out anytime soon. Either that, or you make the checklist small enough that you can do a grouping of maybe fifty guys here, and then fifty guys next year, and then fifty guys. That way, by the time you're ready, you're running out of guys. You have a whole new class of people recycled that you can use. Mm-hmm. Again. Might get stale with the design, though. People might get sick of it. Not if it's a nice design. If it's not too distracting. If it's kind of got a classic look to it. You know, if it's not too gimmicky, then I think I think they'd be fine with it. Make the fronts the same, but not the backs. Make the backs different so you can tell the difference. Well, just at the bottom, you could put Series 1, Series 2, Series 10, Series whatever. Because I would hate them to just have the date and you have to use my old eyes to read what that date says. Yeah, I know, man. It Doesn't it suck that like the text on trading cards gets smaller and smaller, but the collectors get older and older? Well, I know there's a lot of young blood down the hobby and that's a great thing. But, you know, one thing, the guys who founded Upper Deck, the one thing that they wanted was... They wanted the numbers to be big and easy to read. And if you think of those first couple of years of baseball and the first couple of years of hockey, notice they had nice, easy to read numbers on them. That was by design. Yeah. I'm going to blame it on the lighting in the room that I look at most of my cards in, but I've had to resort to a little monocle magnifier. <laughs> that yeah, I, have I, to got, look I at. got this sitting right here on my desk, a little, a little yeah. loop that I, I use all the time. Mine's not that quite sophisticated. Mine looks like it was a piece of glass that fell out of somebody's uh, reading glasses, but it works. Gets the job done. Start wearing the monocle. That should just be your like your thing when you go to go to shows. People start calling me Uncle Pennybags. Wear a top hat. Wear a top hat. There you go. Go Curl my mustache. Full on Monopoly man. Yeah, there you go. So Art of Hockey supposed to come out, and what's up with this set? Like. Is it still summer? It is oh. until the 22nd, then it's it, fall. Until have September to have, 22nd is the first day of fall. You have to ask Brian Gray if it's still summer, because I remember seeing the preview for this, and I think we mentioned it on one of the shows before and talked about it. It was supposed to come out in like May or June. And I thought most of the images of the cards look great. Like Think of masterpieces and enshrined or like the old drawings on the upper deck checklist, yep. paintings. The cards looked like that kind of stuff and it was really cool and i was kind of excited about it and it was coming out this summer and i feel like summer's over and we still don't see it and i wish it would come out yeah it's an unlicensed product but it's leaf and leaf makes pretty decent hockey products in my opinion we'll have to have greg Cohn back on the show to explain himself and 
why it's taking so long for this set to come out. Well, and Lumber hasn't come out either yet. But I like Art of Hockey, the looks on it, better than Lumber. But still, I haven't seen either of those products come out yet. And I hope this isn't like Upper Deck Signature Legends was. If you remember, we talked about Signature Legends early on mm-hmm. in the 21-22 season as being on the list as a 2021 product. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing the sheet for it and remember talking about it and seeing one thing posted by Upper Deck and never another thing about it. Not that it went away, not that it's ever going to come out, neither. And that was a set I was excited about. Crickets. So, I don't know. Nobody's saying they're canceled, but it's kind of weird. Kind of weird. I I definitely want to see the the, uh, art of hockey that Leaf puts out. If you haven't seen these yet, just go on social media or just google leaf art of hockey and you'll see like some of the artwork and stuff that's used for them it's they're nice looking cards and it's probably an expensive set the price point i imagine it's probably going to be a little hefty with autographs and jersey pieces and such sure i imagine it will be but there might be some uh some high-end risk reward on some what's in there all right, so what's this about Brady Kachuk signing some upper deck cards? I don't know if you got to see that. The NHL just had their player media tour in Las Vegas. Yeah. That ended a week or two ago. And, you know, there are players doing all sorts of promotions and stuff out there. And there were some pictures. I don't know if I saw a video, but I did see pictures of Brady Kachuk signing some items for upper deck. Uh, so they were all laid out on the table on the image. And you can see him like signing and he's signing a couple pucks, but over to the side are a bunch of upper deck cards. And you can zoom in on the picture and see that they are, it says lamp lighters and marks of distinction. Now I know marks of distinction has always been in um, SP. It's been like an SP insert. I'm not sure where the lamp lighters come from. So you can zoom in on the photo and you can get close enough that the logo on them kind of looks like a cup logo maybe the ultimate maybe upper deck black i'm not sure but i don't know obviously they're all being hand signed so it's definitely going to be in a product that's more worthy of not having sticker autographs that's for sure definitely not something that's low end but it was kind of cool to see the picture because it kind of gives you a i don't want to say behind the scenes look at what goes into the process sometimes but yeah, here's kind of what goes into the process. Also on the table, you can see the envelope that everything came from, and it's got Upper Deck's letter on top of the envelope that actually says, to whom it may concern, this is very important. These have to be signed, blah, 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 this way with this pen, and any information, or these have to be sent directly to this person, and it says all of it right there. I mean, it's sitting on the table, so it's kind of like a, almost like a behind-the-scenes look into how that autograph process goes. So we'll have to post a link to the the picture in the show notes. Okay, so let's wrap it up with the Fanatics Panini deal. Because even though it doesn't have to do with hockey, it all kind of has to do with hockey because the sports card industry is like a many-headed hydra that like eats its own tail sometimes, you know what I mean? So uh, what does it have to do with hockey? Fanatics, still going to buy Panini. Maybe. It's a rumor. It's a rumor it's that's backed by sooner. fact. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a rumor that's strongly backed by fact, I think. Well, let me ask you this. If you're Panini in Italy, the main company, you're the Panini headquarters in Italy, and you got Panini America, and you just lost the NFL license, and you just lost the NBA license, maybe you have them for another year or two, because I forget when those those deals go to Fanatics. What are you in it for, then? If hockey is spoken for... If basketball and football are being lost and baseball is spoken for, why continue to have a Panini America company? There's no point to it. So if I was Panini in Europe, I would just be like, all right, cool. We're going to sell our stuff because we got no point in being here anymore. We don't have what we used to have. It's different now. Everybody's exclusive. Everybody's exclusives and even... 
stuff like gaming cards and movie cards and stuff like that, which is big business, but you tend to have a lot of the same few companies make them. We say that hockey is the fourth sport, but if you think about it, non-sport is like the fifth sport or the sixth sport or the eighth sport. I mean, it's it's lower. I mean, I argue that Star Wars cards can be more popular sometimes than sports cards or that Pokemon cards can be more popular sometimes than sports cards. But as far as sports goes, if you're Panini and you're losing all your IPs in the U.S., why continue to do business in the U.S.? Cut and run, right? In the U.S., yeah. I don't know that any deal involving them turning over their operations for trading cards would involve dumping the soccer or the sticker business. Maybe it maybe it'll dump the soccer, but I, I can't see it doing the sticker business or the delicious sandwiches. Do they own that too? Mm-mm. They don't oh, make that's... the delicious sandwiches. Oh, that's Jim like... Howard already figured that out the hard way. Okay. Here's without getting into like business theory and all of that kind of stuff. I think there might be a hurdle here with a little thing called a monopoly, possibly. But I'm not sure that anybody in the, I guess, who regulates that kind of stuff, the SEC, I'm not sure anybody at the upper levels is looking at the trading card industry going, yeah, we're going after them because that's a monopoly. They have bigger fish to fry with, like, bigger businesses. So I, I don't know that they would do that, at least in the beginning, right? But is there a possible reality that this could happen? Yes. Could they buy out Panini and Panini's operation, take over the licensing of all of the brand names that Panini has licensed for? Prism, for instance. Yes, the possibility is there. To circle this back around to how it could potentially affect the hockey hobby, you got to think that the dominoes are all falling, okay? Fanatics then owns all of the licensing. They now have taken over two of the biggest card manufacturers that manufactured the cards that had the licensing. That leaves one company standing that has a license left for the major sports that are that popular within the North America and that's upper deck. You know, they have that NHL license. Now looking back on what we've seen historically with what upper deck has said, you know, various people that have been in charge previously and current have said, you know, upper deck's not for sale. We're not selling. We're not going out of business. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. Things change when the wind blows. So you never know when you're going to be approached with a deal that's just way too good to pass up. And if you can roll things into it like, okay, you're going to pay us whatever ungodly number for our company, but you have to give us some assurances that you're not going to fire everybody and do this and that. And if you're comfortable with the deal, what business owner or conglomerate isn't going to be like, okay, we'll take our money and leave. A lot of them will. Again, not to say that Upper Deck is for sale, but let's look at the facts here that we know. Fanatics already has a deal with the NHL for apparel, and they have for a while. The NHL has dealt with Upper Deck multiple times, going all the way back to 1990, granting them licenses pretty much the entire time that they've been manufacturing hockey cards. And every time that that license has come up for renewal, it's gone to Upper Deck in one form or another. When they've split it amongst other companies, Upper Deck's always been one of the companies that's been in the mix. Their current exclusive, we don't know the time frame on it, but it's pretty evident that most of those are five-year deals, which means when Upper Deck's deal comes up, that's right about the time that the Panini deals go up. And the fact that they'd be ending around the same time with the NHL shop their NHL trading card license to a partner that they already have in the apparel business, especially one that's got that much money and that much pull, 
and has established itself now as being the major player when it comes to that kind of thing, I think they'd be fools from a financial standpoint to ignore the truckloads of money that Fanatics would back up to the door to have that license. So a while back when we did talk about this before, two things I want to bring up. When I talked with the Players Association back at the end of last year, now, of course, this was almost a year ago, but they said, we're happy with the job that Upper Deck is doing, and we're not looking to make a change at this time. They kept it kind of light Light and breezy. Well, to the point, because they didn't want to say anything negative about fanatics. And he told me, he said, and this was uh, somebody with the Players Association, and this was for an article that I wrote for the Hockey News. He said, I don't want to say anything bad about Fanatics. We're very happy with our partnership with Fanatics. We're also very happy with our partnership with Upper Deck. And at this time, we had no we had no need or didn't see a need to change what we were doing. So I remember that. I also remember you saying, and this was your theory, you said that Upper Deck can wait and see. You know what? If things are going great for them or get better for them for some reason, then that's fine. And if things start to turn south, then they could throw in with Fanatics. In other words, they don't have to force their hand because they still have the hockey license. If they were going to lose the hockey license in two years or something, then they might say, all right, maybe we'll sell our company now, right? Or the Players Association, same idea. They could wait and see. They could see how things spell out for them. If baseball, football, and basketball cards all of a sudden became way more popular or become way more popular because of however Fanatics is marketing and promoting those products, then they might say, hmm, we want a piece of that. And you know what? We'd really like to see Topps Hockey Cards back on the market. Or they might say, eh, they're not doing anything special. And we kind of like being with a company who only has eyes for us. Yeah, there's that aspect to it. I think this goes even deeper than that. Because look, people have been complaining for the last couple months that panini has like absolutely nothing on their cell calendar for the rest of the year with very few exceptions and people are like well wait a minute the licenses aren't completely up yet they still have all these products that they could put out yet nothing's on these sell sheets there are rumors again and i'm not here to spread rumors i will just merely point them out there are rumors that fanatics has a deal with one of the major printing companies that makes many of the trading cards that are produced by the biggest manufacturers. It's not necessarily an exclusive deal, but it's some type of preferential deal. That if anything comes across their desk and it's a Fanatics product, that moves to the top of the pile. If that's the case, and granted, they have the money to be able to throw around like that and put people in their pockets. If that's the case, that could be one of the reasons that Other companies are like, yeah, we have all these products we wanted to put out and we can't because we can't get them printed. So what do we do? We can't get the print stock. Oh, we can't get this. We can't get that. It's not even any of that anymore. It's we can't get the printers to print them. So if it's come down to that and the printers are now in Fanatics pockets, not that they own them, but they're being influenced by them, then what do people do? Because there's only so many printers available that have the capacity to handle these types of print jobs, right? This isn't like you're sending your flyer for your band playing on Saturday night to be printed by the local copy machine place. Right, right. We're talking mass, huge volumes of printing that are going on. We've seen it this past year that Upper Decks had a bunch of cards that were printed in Italy which caused some different fonts to show up on cards that weren't normally there and people questioned it and it you know they've been printed elsewhere using different printers with different ink and different paper and you know there's a myriad of things that go into that kind of thing and you know we've discussed a lot of this before of what everything that goes into the production of of a product so if you have in north america united states canada one, two, maybe three large enough printers that can handle jobs like that. Yet one, maybe two, even all three 
have some type of deal cut with one of the companies that has three of the major four licenses and owns one of the biggest card companies and possibly potentially a second one, everybody's going to lose out. Because if it's a case of, well, this guy paid me this much, I'm doing his stuff first, and then you guys are going to have to wait till we're done. Then they got to look elsewhere, which causes more delays and causes, you know, this whole, you know, it's, it's a domino effect. It's like a waterfall, you know, it's it's just one thing after another. And ultimately, who does it affect? It affects the collectors, right? Because we're here, we're sitting here waiting for product. We don't get product because there isn't any product. And we're just waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And then when it does come out, it's at a price point that's so ungodly that none of us can afford it. So then we sit and watch and we watch the breakers break it and we watch the flippers break it and we watch a bunch of people get all the hot cards right off the bat and go send them graded. And then we watch their videos of them taking them to card shows and selling them for bajillion dollars. And, and it's like, when does it become our time to get involved with that? Like, I want to buy that product too, but I don't want to pay what you're paying for it. You know, I don't want to pay 10 grand for that case. I might pay five, which is what it was three years ago before you existed, but I don't want to pay 10 because I can't compete with that. And so I think it's that trickle down effect. That was the word I was looking for. I said waterfall, but it, it's, it's this trickle down. Same thing. Idea. It's, yeah. It, it's, it's going to affect everyone in the end. And let's be honest. When has one person being in charge of absolutely everything ever worked out for anyone throughout history? I can't think of a time. It always inevitably backfires somehow. And if fanatics is in charge of pretty much every card that's being manufactured that has a license on it then essentially they have carte blanche to do whatever they want if they want to kill a product they can kill a product if they don't want to produce it they don't produce it if they want to make it half-assed and screw everything up they can do that if they want bad checklists poor card quality all of that they could do that will they i don't see how they would but they could and there's really nobody to check it because there's no competition. So, yeah, this doesn't necessarily affect hockey right away, but I think it does. And I think it will in the long run, especially when Upper Deck's license is up. So for the sake of saving what semblance of what we know as our current hobby, I hope the NHL really looks at that aspect that bigger picture of what it's going to be with one company having control of everything and how hockey could just get ignored i mean you got that too you know upper decks making it because they have the license so they make all of it right and yeah we have a monopoly within hockey but that's within our realm if it gets pushed over to a company that's primary focus is football and basketball and baseball if you have 100% and hockey takes up 10% of the 100, well, they're going to definitely lose out to the other 90%. Then we're back to how it was in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah. We might get one set, two sets, five yeah. sets, or less. Yeah. Well, think about like late 80s, like hockey card sets were small. There were no basketball for tops at the time. Yeah, that was just not a good time for hockey. I don't think we'd go back to that. I think that there's enough interest uh, in hockey that even if Fanatics did eventually get the license to that, because they do so much with hockey apparel anyways, I think they're just kind of seeing this as the next logical step that like, what do people like to do? They like to wear a hat or a jersey or a t-shirt of their favorite team. Well, what else do they like to do? They like to collect memorabilia of their favorite team. Okay, what else do they like to do? They like to collect items that might appreciate in value, right? Like you buy a, a pennant put on your wall, you're not thinking about value, you're thinking about displaying it. But if you buy cards, you're thinking about it might appreciate in value. These cards might appreciate in value. So this just seems like the next logical step for them in that direction. I don't know. I mean, there's the other argument too of this whole thing is maybe they go after upper deck not because they want the card license, 
but because they want the exclusives. You know, think of all the people that Upper Deck has signed on your contract and they only sign. I mean, we already talked about some of them. And that's got to be worth maybe even more than the card business. Well, yeah, exclusives. Knowing you can bring Michael Jordan and LeBron James over into your basketball product and you never could before. I mean, that's worth its weight in gold right there. Easily. I don't know. Like I said, it's all up in the air. Rumors, rumors, rumors. But this is something that's been weighing on my mind since I heard the first rumor about potentially Panini being bought out. Or I should say, specifically Panini America being bought out right, right. by Fanatics and that whole trickle-down effect that it's going to cause to the rest. But uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think we're going to – we'll know sooner rather than later how this is going to play out, I think probably before the end of the year. Yeah, with Panini, yes. But with Upper Deck, I think that's going to be status quo for a little while. At least till the license goes away or right. is off for renewal. Right, or, you know, maybe Fanatics makes a boatload of money with basketball cards, and then they say, okay, now we really need to buy Upper Deck because we really want that LeBron autograph right, so we want the Michael Jordan autograph right. You know, we want the rights to these premier players that Upper Deck has. Yeah, that is a good point, um, is, is getting those rights as well. It'll be interesting to see. You hope in the end there's still something for all of us. Well, there will always be something to collect. I mean, if not, we got plenty of stuff that was manufactured prior to that point that's out there that we can go after. That's what I do. When collecting new stuff prices me out, I go backwards. That's what I did a lot in the late 2000s, early 2010s. I didn't have a lot of money, and so I was buying stuff that was cheap, and I still enjoyed it, you know, because when you love collecting, you love collecting, and You know, you might say, well, I wish I could afford these cards, but hey, here's something else that I could afford. And that's enjoyable, too. You know, like we say, collect what you like. That's the one thing about vintage. Every year, another year gets added. Yeah. All right, let's wrap it up. Thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. If you like this show, please subscribe. Please consider buying a t-shirt at shop.puckjunk.com. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.